as I prepared for this talk, I looked at some TED Talks and read a couple of articles and it said, you should channel your inner superhero when you tell your story. Now, I've been a marine biologist and an oceanographer for 30 years, so clearly Aquaman had to be my choice. <laughs> However, in the last 15 years, my work has really focused on pollution in coastal zones, in developing countries, on sustainability at universities, and more recently, on climate change education. So I changed that to Captain Planet. And I hope that my talk today will inspire you to join Captain Planet and think about things we can do to make sure that our planet is healthy and safe place to live in the future. I want you to think of my talk as a, as an, a play with three acts. The first will be a basic information of some of the science of climate change. The second will give you some impacts connected to climate change and connected to some of the places that we often visit. And the third is a message of hope. Hope that we can work together, that we can work as a community, and that we can do things that will help us deal with these issues about climate change. For the last 50 years, scientists at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography have been collecting carbon dioxide data. Charles David Keeling started this in 1958, and you have in front of you the climate the CO2 curve that is classic, the Keeling curve, and it shows a rapid rise of CO2 in the last 50 years. In fact, this year we crossed the 400 parts per million barrier for the first time in human history. If you think of carbon dioxide and the other gases that part form this heat-trapping blanket above the planet, you see a change in temperature that's associated with this increase in CO2. We're going to expand our time range and now go to 100 years or so. If you look at the basic temperature regime, let's say from the 1880s to 1900 as our baseline, and you look as the time moves on, we see a general pattern of increase in temperature in the last 100 years and especially a very rapid increase, again, in the last 50 years, matching what we saw in the first graph, hitting record temperatures in the last 20 years. And in 2012, a year where there were record temperatures everywhere in the US and across the globe. We have increase in CO2 in time. We have temperature. What does the future tell us? Well, the models tell us that if we go 100 years in the future, we might see even more increases in temperature. The green line is the model predictions of the data that exists, the black line, the actual observations of temperature, and the blue and red lines, two possible scenarios based on CO2 emissions. If we make some changes, the blue line, if we don't make changes, the red line. And we're talking about three or four or six degrees warmer than it is at present time. Now, when you hear about climate change, you hear about some of the sciences, and we always try to figure out how do humans fit? in this equation. So now I'm going to stretch the timeline to 5,000 years. 3,000 years BC, and now we're starting with population growth, and it's a pretty steady rate. Bit of a dip with the bubonic plague. Um, but what you see most importantly in modern days is an exponential increase in human population. And I want you to specifically pay attention to the bubbles on the right. Starting in 1975, every 12 years, we add a billion people to the planet. And if you add 12 years to 1999, it would be the fall of 2011, when I was on semester at sea, and like clockwork, we crossed the 7 billion line in 2011. So if we add CO2 and changes in temperature, it increases in human population. And we try to put that picture together. We can get an idea of what's going on as far as humans and their impacts on climate change. The blue line is model data that would give us the predicted changes in temperature if it was just due to natural causes, volcanoes, solar activity, weather patterns. The red line is the natural causes plus the impacts of humans on the planet. Increases in greenhouse gases, sulfates, effects on the ozone layer. The black line is the real data. You will see the black line clearly mirrors very closely what's been happening with the model that says that humans are impacting climate change. You especially see a closer and closer correlation again, in the last 50 years, as we saw with CO2 and temperature. Now we're on a ship that's about to leave. I'm an oceanographer. I can't leave you without talking about the ocean at least a little bit. So I have to talk about sea level rise at a minimum. In the last 100 years, sea level has gone up by 20 centimeters on a global average, roughly eight inches. The models 
are predicting from this eight inches to a foot or maybe three feet of sea level rise in places around the country. There's a paper that came out that said, good news, it'll be, not, it'll be less than three feet, it'll only be two and a half feet. Islands that are connected to the US are affected by sea level rise today. So we do need to prepare for this, and we especially need to prepare not so much for just the sea level rise itself, but for the coastal flooding that comes with it. So what's the message of the first act? The message is, if we look at the data, if we study over 12,000 papers by climate scientists, the consensus is clear and strong. 97 out of 100 climate experts agree that humans are the cause of global warming. It is not a controversy on the scientific perspective and the scientific confidence of what's going on on climate change. What is this doing to humans? What are the impacts that we feel when we look at climate change? These are photos taken from 2012 in most of the countries. The upper right, flooding in India. The middle right, high tides and coastal flooding in South Africa. The lower right, and I'm, and I'm sure some of you who remember going to Vietnam remember those streets and running across the bikes. Um, flooding in Vietnam, flooding in China, also droughts. So in large countries, you have extremes of both too much water in some places and not enough in others. Now, I had to add the map of Australia there because in the summer of 2012, or in this case, in the winter, because it's January for them, they had to add two new colors to their temperature map because they'd never had temperatures of 50 degrees centigrade, which is over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is happening again. And I just found out, by the way, they're adding color coordination to the lower end of the scale now for that cold temperature that many of you left from the East Coast of the Midwest to come listen to our talks here in San Diego. When we think of impacts of climate change, we need to think about them on a scale of who is most vulnerable. The countries that have the highest emissions, including us in China and Australia, it turns out, are amongst the countries that have the least vulnerability to the impacts. If you look in the lower right and you notice those countries in blue that are primarily centered in the tropics and the subtropical areas, India and Asia and Indonesia, Africa, parts of South America, are the countries that are going to suffer the most and have already started to suffer from the impacts of climate change. When we think of the impacts, we think of certain specific impacts that affect humans the most. Food. We know there's already food insecurity in the world. There'll be problems with crop, not enough water for the crops, there'll be some droughts, there'll be some issues with crops themselves. There may be some, some strange changes too. You notice it says here, possible rising yields in some high latitude regions. In the summer of 2012, all the ice in Greenland melted and they started growing tomatoes and strawberries in Greenland. <laughs> That's not necessarily a good thing, but at least they had some fresh produce for a while. Water. Now, water is a big issue to those of us in Southern California. It's a big issue to anyone who's traveled and been to countries where you know that the stress of water is a big deal. Climate change is going to affect it in unpredictable ways. There may be more floods in some areas, but more droughts in others. There will be certain areas in particular that expect it to be drier. So mostly the Mediterranean, Mediterranean climates, including Southern California, will be drier in the next 10 to 20 years. And because water could cause floods and change impacts on rivers, it can also have an impact on sea level rise and coastal flooding, because now you're getting water from the land going to the coast and water from the coast coming up. So there's going to be a lot of issues affecting water the more the, the planet warms up. Ecosystems are being affected. Coral reefs have already been affected. For those of you who've been to Semester at Sea, have been to some of these places, or those who have traveled and gone snorkeling on coral reefs, you know they're not as great as they used to be. They're already impacted, which affects fishing, which affects our connection to the environment. Species are disappearing as well. And there are more and more extreme weather events. Droughts, wildfires, floods, and these are potentially going to increase even more as climate change continues. But remember I told you that this is a presentation about hope, not just about science, not just about these really sad impacts. It's the end of the sad part, because we have to prepare. Now this graph looks a little complicated, but it really wants to put into perspective the idea that on one end, in orange, are what human activities do to climate change, and on the other end is once this process changed, is how humans are affected by climate change. And we can work together to make this right side of the graph, those red areas, the environmental refugees, the disasters, less. How can we do that? Well, we can do mitigation. 
which m reduces the pace and magnitude of how much carbon dioxide and carbon we put in the, in the planet. We can adapt, reduce our activities, change our way of life in some ways to make things better. Now, it's easier said than done in some countries versus others. But there are some commonalities on what we can do when it comes down to what we individually can do to work on climate change. For it to be successful, it's going to have to be environmentally effective. We want to make sure we have a better environment when we're done, or at least a stable one. It has to be economically affected. There really isn't a dichotomy. We can have technology part of this innovation. We've been hearing about innovation all day. We can continue these innovations. It has to be administratively affected. It means it can't be too complicated. There can't be too many rules that make it hard for us to try new things. It must be equitable on a local scale, on a national scale, on an international scale. And it's going to need political leadership. It's going to need it to be done politically in a way that some countries take the lead. Well, what's most important is what you and you and me can do. Because really, it's based on a community level engagement. It's based on what kind of society we want to live in, what kind of quality of life we want to have, and quality of life that we want to pass on. It's based on the type of environment we want clean water, clean air, plenty of food. And it's important for us to do this because we want to provide opportunities for future generations, for our kids and our children's children, and for generations to come. I'd like to conclude with a discussion about a project I'm involved in that directly connects to this community engagement. Um, I am the leader of the Climate Education Partners, which is a, a group of, uh, of inter interdisciplinary researchers working on climate education in San Diego. We are one of six projects that are funded nationally to develop new ways to present climate change, climate impacts, in a way that would allow people to make smart, informed decisions about what they can do about climate change. Some of the projects focus on middle school and high school. Some will work in museums and zoos and aquariums. Some are working directly with people living on islands affected by climate change and by sea level rise. And ours is a little bit different. Now you might say, I come to San Diego, I don't see any problems with climate change. I was gassing up my car the other day and our temperature said 76, 76, 76, and no negative signs in front of that. <laughs> However, there are issues here too. And so our team, has a really multidisciplinary perspective, and that, I think, is one of the lessons to learn. We can't work at this as just scientists or just academics or just people working in the social sciences. Our team has marine scientists, climatologists, and science educators from the Marine Science and Environmental Studies Department at USD, cutting-edge climate researchers who do meteorology and hydrology from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UCSD, behavioral psychologists who look at environmental responses at Cal State San Marcos, but also practitioners, people on the ground working with groups. EPIC, Energy Policy Initiative Center, works with policy on water and energy. The San Diego Foundation has been working with communities to develop climate action plans. And we have a strategic communication person that helps us put our stories together. Our plan is pretty simple. First, we focus on local climate science, local impacts, things you can feel right here in San Diego County. We work with the key influentials, the top leaders, the political leaders, the faith-based leaders, the tribal leaders, the community leaders themselves. And we hope that together we put a package of information, some ideas and some potential activities that will allow us to create our own circle of trust, our own set of ripples. And we specifically focus on the key influentials because though they may be small in number, 150 of the key important people, they influence groups, the boards that they're on, the companies that they work with. They influence their own constituencies. Now we're talking hundreds of thousands of people. In some cases, they may be the messenger for us rather than we being the messengers of all climate change. So it's a new model to really engage decision makers to be part of this solution to the impacts of climate change. This is a model that we think could be also used nationally. Local climate change where you are, where these countries are, will be different. We can talk about wildfires here. It's very dear to the people who suffered through them in 03 and 07. But we also know that everywhere there are communities of people working together that want to work together to solve this. And we do it because we want to make sure that the next generation has a great place to live. Thank you.